uh, we're going to focus pretty much on that and sort of the, the you know, kind of reverberations of that rebellion. Um, for those of you who may not know, that is the day that Market, uh, Marquette Fry was arrested by the California Highway Patrol, uh, allegedly for reckless driving, drunk driving on 116th and Avalon Boulevard, along with his brother and mother, Rena Price, who were trying to intervene. And as a result of that arrest um, by California Highway Patrolmen, and then some of the, the, the momentum surrounding that event, uh, we get the Watch Rebellion. Of course, there's more to it, and we're going to get to it uh, right now. Um, but what I want to do is begin really by asking a question about um, the origins and the response, you know, the and specifically, you know, one of the one of the points you make in the book is that when you step back and look at the national picture, uh, the Watts Rebellion erupted just the week after Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act, and everyone was celebrating the act. We shall overcome, you know, his famous statement of repeating the, the civil rights movement, and yet no one was prepared for what happened. Uh, in Watts, except for the people who were there, of course. Uh, and so I wonder if you could begin by just talking about that, um, about the, both, you know, um, how, uh, what, why the media was so caught off guard, uh, and also, you know, why the coverage of the Watts Rebellion, especially by LA Times, is so terrible. Well, the, um, you know, the, the, the mainstream media, the conventional wisdom was that America's race problem was located in the South. Mm -hmm. And this had been the center of, of political struggle, of heroism by black people, and of news coverage for five years. There'd been the, the sit-in movement of 1960. There'd, there'd been the, the fabulous uh, Birmingham movement of 1963. Mass. This was the police dogs, the fire hoses, the masses in the streets, the thousands of arrests. Then, then there was Mississippi Freedom Summer '64, the killings of uh, Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman. '65 began with the, the Selma to Montgomery march, the 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 bridge, you know. Uh, uh, um, and then, as you say, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act. This was the most far-reaching uh, Civil Rights Act since the end of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the, the conventional wisdom was, it's over, we've done it. The black people have won, the Negroes have won. Mm -hmm. And then one week later, Watts erupts and, and everybody says, what, what happened? What did we miss? Right. And, our, and I think that's what our book is about, what they right. missed. Right, exactly. Um, do you want to say something about the LA Times coverage? Of it? Because some of those headlines are Yeah, the, the, the LA Times, uh, the LA Times at the time uh, was a right-wing newspaper, mm -hmm. and uh, their headlines on the first day were, uh, Anarchy Must End. <laughs> and uh, what was the other one? Negro, uh, Negro pro, uh, uh, racial unrest laid to Negro family failure. <laughs> that was the deep right. think piece, right. as opposed to the news report, anarchy must end. I mean, the only decent coverage was in the LA Free Press. Their headline was, the Negroes have voted. Uh, <laughs> the LA Free Press had just begun a publication. Art Kunkin, the editor, uh, had worked with Core in the previous few years. He was a, a an old leftist who'd also been worked on the Socialist Workers Party newspaper. So he was in touch with uh, with black writers and was able to bring in uh, uh, blacks to write a right. bit for for the LA Free Press. And that really created the LA Free Press. Then became the the largest. Um, uh, underground press uh, newspaper in, in the country and eventually had a quarter of a million circulation, which was really necessary given what the, the LA Times was. Right. So Mike, I know you lived through the Watts Rebellion as well as, you know, one, the premier historian of the events that led to it and afterward. Uh, and I wanted to, to sort of address a couple of things. I mean, you know, of course, from your book, 
it's clear we know why the rebellion happened. I mean, there's no question. Um, you're talking about a, 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 an area of Los Angeles, South LA, with double digit unemployment, uh, with a medium income level below the poverty line, severe housing shortage and continued uh, segregation of housing, let alone the police operating uh, its own, um, uh, as, as you called it, um, a successful negative employment scheme, which is <laughs> what we can talk about. So can you talk about, like, you know, for, for those who don't know, what, what, were the, what were the conditions that led to it? Uh, and, you know, what did the rebellion represent as not so much a riot, but a clear-cut insurrection? So in the beginning of the decade, the U.S., the newly constituted U.S. Civil Rights Commission, held hearings um, in Los Angeles, and they were stunned by what they found in LA. 99% of the suburban housing that had been built since the end of the war was totally off limits to African Americans, uh, in many cases to Latinos as well, depended really more on their skin shade or not, whether mm -hmm. you could be accept accepted. Uh, Employment was double that of uh, white groups and almost as high uh, uh, on the east side. It was a situation that uh, later sociologists would call super segregation. And there's two cities in the United States that have worn that uh, onerous label. One is Chicago uh, and the other is LA. At the end of 1962, LA volunteers on the Freedom Rides uh, in the South returned. Some of them had been badly injured. All of them had been jailed. Uh, some of them were just teenagers, like Jimmy Garrett, who's one of the kind of fathers of Black Studies, who's a sick guy in LA. And they reactivated an old Congress of Racial Equality chapter. Now, CORE has kind of been written out of the mainstream. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, civil rights history, but it was the the engine, the driving force behind uh, the civil rights movement in Los Angeles, and directly contesting segregation in in the suburbs. And this ended up in a, a harrowing, but long sustained, very brave campaign to open up a, a new suburb in the city of Torrance, an all white city that had been the most rapidly growing city in LA County uh, during the 50s. And out of that struggle and coinciding with the Birmingham freedom movement, uh, a United Civil Rights Movement uh, was organized in LA and included you know, most of the younger church leaders, the NAACP and of course CORE and little SNCC group. And they mobilized thousands of people in demonstrations and protests. And they sought to negotiate directly with the LA's power structure, with its business leaders, its political leaders, education institutions like SC and the school board. And at the end of the day, they were totally defeated. Mm. You know, a lot of people said, we understand your pain, but nothing, Nothing was, was done. Right. On the other hand, a counter-revolution against civil rights was growing in, Southern, in, in California as a whole. And the next year, after uh, SNCC had splintered and, and the, the more radical SNCC members called themselves NVAC, and they ended up facing long jail sentences and so on, just for sitting in at restaurants uh, uh, that discriminated. But what happened over the course of, the, of, of that year was California had, had legislature just adopted a fair housing law, something of a miracle, uh, which had been proposed by Byron Rumford, uh, a, a great civil rights figure uh, from Oakland. And it's the politics are complicated. I won't go into it, except that Jesse Unruh, big daddy in California politics, kind of a Tennessee Williams figure, you can imagine. You know, Orson Welles smoking a cigar or something. 
Unruh, who was a poor kid from, white kid from West Texas, threw his weight behind it and actually got through the legislature. In November of 1964, two thirds of California's white voters voting for something called Proposition 14, repeal fair housing. It was a referendum uh, on equality and overwhelmingly white voters uh, opposed it. In November, in a few weeks after the, the election of November, beginning of December, uh, a team of uh, UCLA Institute of Industrial Relations people, including Bob Singleton, who was one of the um, founded the core chapter on, on the West Side and been a freedom writer. And Paul Bullock, uh, who's a very noble figure in LA history. We don't have time to go into it, but everybody mm -hmm. should read the book. Uh, look at Paul, Paul Bullock. They published an enormous 600 page report, the fruit of a year of research on hardcore unemployment uh, in LA. Now, six weeks before this report came out, UCL economists, uh, uh, Business Roundtable, had predicted that 1965 would be probably the year of, of the fastest, most extraordinary growth uh, since the Second World, World War. Hmm. Unemployment was rapidly declining uh, in white communities. The Bullock Report found that it was un increasing amongst black youth from 10% up to 15 in some neighborhoods, 30%. It found that black women, desperate to get into the work uh, force, since so many uh, black men were excluded. And again, the LAPD deliberately, systematically criminalizing, uh, you know, the male black working class, 60% of black women uh, were unemployed who wanted to be uh, uh, unemployed. Now, this meant that black people, as well as Latinas, were being locked out of this, of, of this uh, tremendous boom. They also weren't getting any help from the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, Washington had allocated $22 million for youth employment, for employment schemes in LA, but Sam Yorty, the right-wing populist mayor, uh, refused to accept it because the federal government had this thing called maximum feasible participation. Then ensured there was some token representative of the community and the administration of poverty funds. He refused to accept that. And so at the beginning of the summer, uh, there was funding for 20,000 youth jobs. It didn't come because of his refusal. He blocked it. None of the war in poverty money uh, was coming to Los Angeles. Uh, there was also a big struggle in 1965, right up to the week before the, uh, uh, the rebellion against uh, redevelopment. Mm -hmm. the University of Southern California had created and was the driving force between for redevelopment plan, urban rural plan, displaced 1,500 families, mainly black, uh, in the Exposition Park uh, Hoover area. And this created an uh, incredible amount of, of anger. I mean, I could, I could go on, but those are the principal things that made the rebellion inevitable. But the really important point is that the rebellion was not only inevitable, it was absolutely necessary at that point. All the bridges had been cut off to any kind of peaceful reform. The vast majority of white voters had rejected any kind of equality uh, in California. So all it took then was uh, a spark. And it really, the spark in some ways was really not the Fry brothers stopped by the Highway Patrol block from their house, uh, uh, a little bit intoxicated. But it was somebody called Beverly Tatt, which white people in LA never heard of, have never known about. And she was a young woman who was kidnapped and raped by LAPD officers uh, in July, a month before uh, uh, the uprising. 
and later after the rebellion, she was waiting to testify to a grand jury. One of the cops was fired quietly and removed from the scene, which is equivalent to uh, admission of his uh, of his guilt. She died then uh, under mysterious circumstances, and she was pregnant, and mm -hmm. it's never been clarified. So nobody in the White Committee Times had one tiny article about it, but Jet Magazine, the national black magazine of record, had uh, several uh, big articles on it. The Sentinel uh, and the California Eagle, you know, almost daily were talking about that. So when the one of the Marquette brothers uh, refused to be handcuffed, and when 26 LAPD squad cars and motorcycles descended on the scene, when the Fry's mother, Rena, who was all of five foot tall, mm -hmm. was thrown against a squad car. And then an LAPD officer raided in, and he was cheered by a young black woman, a hairdresser from just down the street. He put her in a stranglehold, a chokehold. That was too much. Mm -hmm. uh, not after, you know, the murder, of the, the rape of Tate, and, and so on. Right. And of course, catalyst is not the same as the cause. Right, right. But, exactly. but that's, that's a part of history that's uh, uh, been only known to people who <laughs> live in the South Side. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, I'm so glad you brought that up because it, it was on my list of things to talk about, the, the Beverly Tate case, because in some ways she was like the Latasha Harlins of the 1992 rebellion that, you know, we think about um, the beating of Rodney King. But people came out in the streets also, you know, for justice for Beverly Tate um, as well. And the other thing which is so important is, is you know, like you say, there's a catalyst, uh, but there's also the level of organization. And that's one thing that's really laid out beautifully that people were organized. I mean, um, I'm, you know, Woodrow Coleman was one of the organizers for, for CORE at the time. And, and I was, I'm, so happy I got to know him, you know, when he was organizing with the Bus Riders Union as an older person uh, and had this history I knew nothing about until I read your book. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, I want to jump now into, before we get into the sort of implications today, I kind of want to linger on the aftermath, the immediate aftermath of the rebellion, because one of the things I learned from the book is the degree to which people came out not defeated. On the contrary, um, they produced and tried to enact certain dreams of freedom, you know, that came out of that rebellion. You know, you have the, the cultural renaissance in, 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 in Watts, you know, the music and art, theater, literature, uh, community organizing. And you also have, which I learned a lot about, Freedom City. I'm hoping to talk about that. That is the, the effort spearheaded by Cliff Balls of, of SNCC to, to basically incorporate Watts and create a separate city, which didn't succeed, but imagine what might have happened. So if you could talk a little bit, you know, both of you talk a little bit about the, so that moment after um, Watts, which is a kind of, could be seen as a bright moment, even though the police continued to do its, its stuff. Well, there was this, we, what became known as the Watts Renaissance. Huge surprise, a really artistic uh, 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 <clears throat> flowering. Mm -hmm. uh, Horace Tapscott in the world of uh, avant-garde jazz. He'd been around, but uh, now he, he, he was everywhere. You know, I've been watching uh, reruns of Bosch on, on TV, and there's a, one scene where a Bosch, a LA cop show, not exactly our politics, but Bosch is at uh, Amoeba Records, and Bosch is a jazz fan, and he's showing his daughter a Horace Tapscott vinyl, and she says, I don't know who that is, and he says, avant-garde jazz and social justice. <laughs> this is, this is Bosch, Bosch on, on, uh, you know, on, on, on TV. Uh, and then there was also this assemblage uh, movement of, of uh, mm -hmm. sculptors, uh, Noah Purifoy, people who picked up uh, basically the, the, the detritus of the riots and made sculpture out of it. I mean, at the time, you know, a tremendously humble thing, taking off partly from the Watts Towers, which were also assembled from 
junk in the streets uh, uh, around there. Um, uh, of course, there was also the Watts Writers uh, Workshop. So it's a huge culture, uh, the, um, the What's Happening um, Cafe, performance, plays, music, uh, sculpture. Uh, the sculpture now is, you know, priceless. It's shown at uh, the County Museum. Um, uh, um, so this was a big surprise, I think, to everybody that this w event, which was supposed to be so destructive, I mean, black people burning their own neighborhoods, uh, led to this artistic uh, flowering in in so many art forms. Right, right. The um, the struggle, of course, didn't cease in the streets. There were two subsequent uh, Watts rebellions, the Watts riots against the police. And in 1966, after this. Uh, confabulated uh, McCone Commission report, uh, uh, Pat Brown was getting ready to run against Ronald Reagan and against Jordy in the Democratic primary. So he went to his friend and special counsel, Warren Christopher, later Secretary of State, for advice. And he said, whatever you do, this should not read like a civil rights manifesto. This should come from the establishment. So John McCone, former head of the CIA, right whose knowledge of the black community uh, is solely based on the fact that he'd run a wartime shipyard, which exploited black uh, uh, labor, it was, was uh, commissioned to report on it. And the report, uh, which mainly was based on testimony from Yorty and Parker, totally exonerated the police, it said that peaceful, so-called peaceful civil rights leaders had really instigated this by their irresponsible protests, and that the participation was really a, a tiny group, a tiny cr criminal residuum had come up from the South. Later, this theory was totally blown out of the water mm. uh, because UCLA at this point had just got the same supercomputer, IBM supercomputer, uh, that the Strategic Air Command used, and they used it to process arrest records and interviews with people arrested. And it turned out that the average person uh, arrested did not have previous encounters with the police, did not, from the South, had grown up in LA, tended to be perhaps a year or two more educated than others. Mm -hmm. And that something like 15% of black males who participated indirectly, another 40%, uh, had been out in the streets kind of cheering people on. So it blew this uh, uh, totally out of the water. One reason, perhaps, that there was no riot report uh, in 1992 uh, mm -hmm. might have shown that the grievances and, and causes were real. Right. But what happened in 66 was that uh, a black Georgian named Leonard uh, Deadweiler uh, was raising his uh, pregnant wife uh, to the hospital, and it, it was the custom in the rural south, an emergency like that, you put a white handkerchief on your uh, car and tent, and the police instantly know it's an emergency. And his background was extraordinary because he came from one of less than 20 black people still living in a county of Georgia where in the 1920s, uh, the entire black population had been forced out of the county with uh, a lynching and, 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 and killing. So I mean, this is the kind of history that people brought to the, right. uh, uh, the city. And he was just murdered by a cop. Cop reached in the window and shot him, killed him. And this produced uh, a big protest movement, a sensational inquest. And out of that would emerge the Black Congress, which was a unity organization like the United Civil Rights Group was, but far, far more radical. Brought all the black power together. Uh, the SNCC, the remains of CORE, uh, the Communist Party, and what would become its Che Lumumba Club, eventually the Panthers, and the powerful US organization founded by uh, Ron Karenga. Uh, and for a year and a half, people were hand in hand. Uh, us organized the largest uh, uh, rally to free free Huey Newton. This is a spectacular moment of black unity, 
and also at a period of very creative tactics. Uh, something called the Community Alert Patrol was created, which became a template for uh, the emergent Panthers mm -hmm. in the Bay Area. People would follow the police around, including marked cars. When police stopped somebody, they would stop 100 feet away and photograph uh, what was going on. It drove the police absolutely crazy. The tactic had actually originated in Mississippi in the South, but uh, it was absolutely sensational uh, uh, at the time. And all the people who'd been out in the streets, so many of the people who'd been out in the streets the previous August were now organized into groups like the Sons of Watts or into uh, the US organization, mm -hmm. later, you know, into the Panthers. This unified youth, and it showed that the new breed could not be pushed around by the police, but would fight back with unity as its major uh, principle. And of course, the murder of that unity by COINTELPRO, the LAPD, et cetera, uh, is, a, is a tragic story that follows later on. But in that period, for a couple of years, um, LA you saw the fruits of the, the rebellion in so many different ways. Right. And COINTELPRO also destroyed um, the arts renaissance as well, you know, burned down the, that 300 seats theater that was a safe wage transformed into a people's theater, you know. Um, well, you know, can you say something about um, Freedom City? I just think that's such a great story. Um, you know, just a few words, because I think a lot of people don't know about Freedom they, they People know probably more about Palo Alto and its effort to create, you know, Nairobi as a separate uh, incorporated entity. But, you know, Watts as an incorporated entity, you know, under black governance, that was Freedom City. Can you talk about that? Well, first of all, the, the largest minority in LA County were uh, Mexican Americans whose youth would soon become Chicanos. But the community political power had been cut in half or more by the fact that East LA is outside the city limits. It's an unincorporated enclave policed by the uh, sheriffs. And there have been several attempts earlier and we're talking about going back to the early mm -hmm. 60s to incorporate East LA. It was opposed by business community and it was opposed by uh, the Labor Council for reasons you, you know, can guess. And uh, was narrowly defeated, but it was a potent idea. Right. And the same idea rose immediately after the Watts Rebellion. Watts had been a separate uh, town once upon a time, incorporated town. It was a railroad uh, community where track laborers lived and so on. And so reincorporate uh, Watts uh, as Freedom City. But by this time, there were new laws in California that set up an agency which determined uh, whether you could have elections to to uh, incorporate or secede from an existing city. And they shut down the movement. Mm. But the movement for, uh, to create radical free spaces is, is separate cities didn't disappear. And John, you should say something about the case of Venice. Mm -hmm. Venice, yes, yeah, definitely. Let's talk about Venice. Just very, very briefly, Venice also launched a movement to to secede or to de-annex. Venice had also been an independent uh, city up to the 20s. And um, they were one of these places that was, as we say today, over-policed. The police would, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sweep the beach, beat up kids. There was always something going on in Venice that the police didn't like. Um, and so there was a big movement um, to, to uh, de-annex and um, July 4th, uh, 1967 was the, uh, the, the parade was going to be to announce the, the campaign for independence of the city of Venice. Uh, they didn't get a parade permit, um, the huge police deployment to prevent them from marching. 
Um, like Watts, the, the de-annexation movement was blocked by the city fathers. The vote never happened, and Venice today has been gentrified and become the home of uh, Google and Snapchat and, uh, <clears throat> you know, the houses cost millions of dollars now. Right, right. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize Venice actually had a vibrant Black community, and Black and Brown community. Oh, um, Oakwood. Oakwood had been Oakwood, there since exactly. the 20s. And um, in one of the only black beaches in Southern California was a little bit of what's now Venice Beach, where uh, black people from, from Oakwood were, were allowed to have a few hundred yards of the beach. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm looking at our time and I'm wanting, I know we, we started late, so we're going to take some extra time. Um, so I want to kind of move towards some, some closure in an opening. Uh, yeah. And I was thinking, you know, when we were talking before we went on, on the air, um, I talked about the chapter right before the epilogue on Watt Stacks. And that, you know, Watt Stacks in 72 was this massive benefit concert, you know, held at the LA Coliseum. People might have seen the, the documentary to commemorate the seventh anniversary of the Watts Rebellion. And it was supposed to be a kind of showcase of community progress. But what it did was it masked the hard reality that for working people in South LA, there was no appreciable change in the socioeconomic conditions. The, the film actually does capture this in some of the interviews and you, you deal with this in, in the book. Um, and then less than a year later, Tom Bradley is elected. Uh, and, you know, and, and this is, as I mentioned before, this is around the time my mom moved to LA, like 1971, and so she experienced the downturn, and then that moment of hope, because she remembers that vividly. It's like a black mayor who was actually ran as a progressive in 69, a black mayor, things are going to be so great. But as you point out in your book, he did run a progressive campaign in 69, but 73, he did not, but he was, he was defeated because he underestimated the forces of reaction, uh, mm -hmm. resistant to change. And so he, he made his peace with the kind of with the developers, he made his peace with finance capital, he made his peace, you know, becoming the kind of classic neoliberal city, big city mayor. And it was under Bradley that Eula May Love was killed, that 15 black men were killed by chokehold, that the tightening repression of black and brown neighborhoods under the guise of the war on drugs, the killing of Latasha Harlan's and Rodney King, all this under um, Bradley. So here's my provocative question, but I want you to take it wherever you want to go. So how much of what we've inherited can be attributed to the Bradley period? You know, we, we tend to jump back to William Parker and Yorty, um, but your book suggests a much more complicated story. Well, behind, behind his election, of course, uh, is something very important. And that was healing the split between the entertainment and savings and loan industry, which was uh, largely Jewish, democratic, and the old downtown establishment. And one result of the Watts Rebellion was increasing pressure for the two groups uh, to combine in a common project. And that project became, ultimately, the creation of a world-class infrastructure in Los Angeles the globalization of its economy. Mm. Uh, and, you know, one part of that, of course, was downtown urban renewal, uh, where you forced out 10,000 poor elderly people out of downtown uh, to get, create giveaways to, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, you know, banks and, and, you know, and so on. So at the very top, LA had been really distinctive in having this split or splintered. Uh, uh, power structure, but the power structure became more powerful than ever. And uh, of course, the uh, Norman uh, Chandler's uh, 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 grandson, uh, who became uh, in this period the uh, proprietor of the Times, played a Otis Chandler played a large, a large uh, behind the scenes role, and he turned the Times around, and it ended up endorsing. Uh, Bradley in 1973. Uh, 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 and you don't want to blame all the sins of the period on Bradley, 
but it's significant how successful and efficient his administration was in these huge investment projects downtown at the airport and modernizing the harbor. While on the other hand, in the late 70s, when deindustrialization mm. hit LA like an earthquake, this is right in the period when black, young black and Chicano workers were finally gaining through consent decrees mobility in the plants and in coming into labor leadership and having these powerful union bases with strong community ties was enormously important. It, it was, you know, this was seen as a whole new platform for successful struggles, but the plants closed down rapidly uh, one after another and Bradley never lifted a finger. And this led to deeper division between his part of the black community on the west side he represented a district uh, uh, in the Crenshaw area that was uh, majority black, but it also had some whites, liberal whites, it had Japanese Americans, and the east side uh, of the community. Now, the west side profited in the Bradley era by getting a lot of civil service jobs. Suddenly, the postal carriers, bus drivers, concessionaires, the airport, there was upward mobility there. But for the east side, the poor side of, of the community, which relied on the hope of gaining uh, unionized private sector jobs, the ground was cut under their feet and nobody came to their aid until some uh, <laughs> Cuban exiles, the CIA and Colombian uh, drug dealers turned up later in the 1980s with their own plan for reindustrializing re the south side. Uh, Robin, you, yes. you 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 name you 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 name the names of Latasha Harlins and Eula Love, and that I want from that I want to go back and I want to go forward. Great. Say the names is so important. Thirty-four people were killed in the Watts uh, Rebellion, almost all of them by the police or the National Guard. We don't know their names. Their names were never celebrated. If you want to find them, you can barely find them in the definitive 400-page book that studies every single murder, every single death in the Watts Rise, the book by, by James Conant, uh, Rivers of Blood, Years of Darkness. We don't know those names. So say that today we do know the names, mm. and it's one of the greatest achievements of the Black Lives Matter movement. We know the names of, you know, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ray Sherrod Brooks in Atlanta. Um, what we're seeing today is, you know, the largest popular mobilization in American history, really, over the last few months. And a key part of it has been say their names. So right. we know some of the names from the past. We know Latasha, Latasha Harlan's from 92. We know Eula Loves. But this movement has taught us to say the names. And that is a huge difference from what happened to the 34 people who were killed in the Watts uprising. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, now that you brought us to, to the present, um, let's, let's talk about that as a kind of final uh, area of discussion. I mean, um, you know, as you know, I wrote this, this essay coming out on your book, which um, I'm very happy with, you know, and <laughs> part, of, part of what the essay does is it kind of concludes with some reflections on having read, because I read the book, uh, I began reading the book in the midst of the, uh, the first part of the pandemic. So I read it through the lens of COVID and, you know, and then that's the lens. And then it became uh, the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery. And that became the lens um, because it took a long time to read it. <laughs> because <laughs> only, only 800 pages with the footnotes. Um, but, you know, so in thinking about uh, the, the implications, the lessons, there's so many lessons this book offers the current generation. Uh, and I just, you know, I want you to just leave with some reflection, both of you leave with some reflections on what might be the, the key lessons. And before I say that, let me just give you mine, you know, because I, you know, we may not be together for a while, so I'll just share it. 
And one of the things that I thought really hard about wasn't the protests taking place uh, in West Hollywood, in the, around the Beverly Center, in Beverly Hills, but the quietness in South LA, which doesn't mean that it wasn't action. I mean, Lauren Halsey, this wonderful artist, uh, started this kind of revolutionary project um, in, you know, in the midst of COVID, in fact, before COVID, which was about creating a community center in South LA, where she grew up. And, in, and she couldn't do it with COVID. And so she ended up uh, putting together this fabulous food bank, you know, um, and, and the community center of sorts that really provides free food. It's called Summer Everything uh, Community Center. And they just give out free food to people in the community. And as a response to state violence, as a response to COVID, as a response to the, um, the organized abandonment of that community, it's a beautiful project. It's not the thing you think of, you know? Uh, and I got that from your book because in some ways, there's so much we haven't talked about of <clears throat> organizations engaged in mutual aid, free clinics, the whole free clinic movement. You know, that is part of the story of LA and LA is a pioneer in so many of these kinds of struggles. So that's my sort of reflection. What are your reflections on just the meaning of this book in this moment and what we can learn? John? Well, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think Black Lives Matter has really very much at all to learn from, from the history we tell in our book. They're a hundred times better organized than anything we had in the 60s. Mm -hmm. They've been doing this already for five years. They are everywhere. They have unity. Uh, what they have achieved in the last six months is unprecedented in American history. Um, you know, they, they don't need to learn anything from us. We need to learn from them. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm very impressed with how the, the current generation of black organizing is, is just miles ahead of, of where we were uh, 55 years Years ago. Right, right. I think what impresses me almost as much is the degree of unity amongst yes. Black, Latino, immigrant youth across the country. So much attention has been paid to white participation. But what's really going on here, mm -hmm. if you look at the inner city high schools, if you look at the community college, there's unprecedented unity amongst people of color, or people who are uh, uh, immigrants. I see that through the lens of my own kids who go to an inner city high school, and they're Mexican, and they've been with Black Lives Matter from the, uh, from the very beginning. We should also acknowledge that Black Lives Matter saved uh, us from a major depression and demoralization of activism that occurred when Bernie Sanders conceded to Biden. Now, everybody had been told that we're working in two tracks here. There's movement in the street and workplace, and there's a political campaign, and each supports the other. But we saw once the concession was made, uh, where did the movement go? Certainly, it was all appeals to support progressive candidates, which, of course, we should all do, and so on. But Black Lives, and I saw it here. I, was, uh, I had to go back to, to work, and I was teaching at a college down, down here. And I saw this terrific depression amongst the Bernie uh, supporters. And then all of a sudden, Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and in a sense, saved all the energy and movements that had come. It had built kind of arc for that. Uh, but we must be aware that we're in an entirely new historical period. Right, right. Um, I, 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 know, I know our time is up. Um, can I take 30 seconds to say one thing, which is that there's a, there's a generational uh, benefit that the stories that you tell in that book are directly, have directly passed on through generations. Uh, and and I, I really do want to emphasize that because, you know, one of, one of my favorite students um, when I was at NYU uh, was Fanon Wilkins. His dad was Brother Cook. Ron Wilkins, um, who found, was one of the founders of Community Alert Patrol, 
uh, or if you can even think of something like, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore and the work of abolition and how much of that builds on Mother's Rock and the organization of struggles in the 1990s. Uh, that, of course, Mike Davis's book, which I call the, the sequel, <laughs> the City of Courts, as the prequel sequel, right, to this book, you know, shows that these generational patterns and, and knowledge passes on. And that's one of the reasons why this generation is so spectacular. Anyway, sorry, I know you got to close. Um, I, just, I just wanted to say, um, I hope everybody can hear me, um, that this book is terrific. And what I take away from it is that I really was inspired by the activism. And I hope that it inspires kids and high school kids and um, and college kids to get out there uh, and do what they need to do like people did in the 60s. And so um, may it inspire and get this book through ESSA1. Uh, go on the website, writersblockpresents.com. You'll find the ESSA1 link. They have tons of copies. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you soon. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Robin, Robin, we have to talk about jazz at some point. Oh, yes, <laughs> we will. <laughs> okay, I'll see you.